Well, again, brethren, in God's goodness, we're brought to this session after lunch, and I'm sure our need is as great today as it was yesterday, and perhaps even greater. I understand the preacher wore everybody out this morning, so we'll look to the God who says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Let's lay hold of that God and his promise as we seek his face together. Our Father, we are deeply grateful again that we come to you, the living and the true God, the God who is our Father through Jesus Christ, the God who knows our frame, remembers we are dust, the God who delights to give freely good gifts to your children. You are the Father of lights with whom is no variableness or shadow cast by turning. You are the God who has said that you are the giver of every good and every perfect gift. So we come and ask for the good gifts of your presence to quicken our minds, to strengthen our bodies, to give us the necessary physical and mental energy to engage the totality of our redeemed humanity, both in delivering this material and in receiving it. Father, we are a mass of sinful weakness, but you are a God of infinite grace and kindness. So come to us in that grace and kindness by the ministry of your Holy Spirit, We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's very liberating to be honest with God, isn't it? Just tell him what he already knows. (laughs) Say, Lord, here I am, a mass of weakness and sinfulness, but you're a gracious God. Well, in our previous lecture, dealing with what I have chosen to call corrective or radical church discipline, I spent the entire time simply to establish one point, namely the necessity for corrective or radical church discipline. And I said that that necessity rested down upon two massive pillars, the first constructed of the stuff of the words of our Lord Jesus as found in Matthew 18, 15 and following, and in several of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2. And then the second massive pillar was that of the record of apostolic injunctions and apostolic practice in various forms of corrective or radical church discipline. Now in this hour, we want to take up secondly the purposes of corrective discipline. In setting out these various purposes clearly highlighted in the scriptures, I want to emphasize that I'm not treating them in a subjectively conceived order of importance or that there is an assumed equality among all of them. Rather, as we look at the various passages dealing with the subject, several purposes emerge. Hence, the purpose of corrective discipline is not simple, but complex. It is not one-sided, but multifaceted. And as we consider them, don't look at them as though they are blocks stacked one upon another with either increasing, like an inverted pyramid, or decreasing importance, but look upon them as pieces in a pie. And wherever you start, Keep looking at the pieces till you end up with the last one. So we're not looking at blocks that are setting forth some perception of degree of importance, one, two, three, four, etc. In setting out the biblical witness, I acknowledge my great debt to Jonathan Edwards and his excellent sermon on this subject found in volume two of his collected works, and the very helpful little booklet by Daniel Ray uh, produced a number of years ago, Biblical Church Discipline, and in your notes, 
you're told that it is now handled and printed by solid ground publications. And in my present understanding, I'm prepared to say that according to the scriptures, there are at least, least six distinct purposes for the administration of corrective discipline. And though some of them overlap, I believe each one has enough difference to make a distinction in thinking through in some orderly way what are the divinely revealed purposes of corrective discipline. And the first I address is this, the maintenance of the honor of God in his church. Just as each individual Christian is to reflect the character of God and to be holy as God is holy and because he is holy, so the church in its corporate life and identity is to have the same passion. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, uh, 9 through 12, Peter speaks of the church in its manifold identity using rich language taken directly from the description of God's old covenant people. And he says, but you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he goes on to give that appeal that as sojourners in pilgrims, they are to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul to what end? That having their behavior seemly among the Gentiles, though people speak against them as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Where sin is tolerated, then the horrible realities of Romans 2, 22 to 24 is the result. Where Paul is going after the conscience of those who pride themselves that they are the seed of Abraham, that they are the circumcision, the favored covenant people of God. Paul says in that text in Romans 2, 22, you say a man should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You that abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who glory in the law through your transgression of the law, dishonor God. For the name of God is blaspheme among the Gentiles because of you. And if that is true of that old covenant community that claimed to be the people of God when life and experience contradicted name and profession, the name of God is jeopardized. This is one of the motives that Paul lays before older women as to why they should train the younger women to be exemplary in domestic piety and godliness. In Titus 2 and verse 5, here is his great motive. The older women train the younger women to be sober-minded, chaste, workers at home, kind, in subjection to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. In other words, even unconverted people expect that those who name the name of Christ and who profess to be the people of Christ have an alternate lifestyle that validates that profession or they blaspheme the name of God and of Christ. And brethren, this reality must grip our hearts as under shepherds so that something bigger and far more important than our feelings will always stand before us when confronting issues that may warrant corrective discipline. The burning passion for God's glory in the church must swallow up all of our natural carnal timidity, fear, and unwillingness to engage in this aspect of church life. 
Jesus described the new covenant community as the light of the world and also the salt of the earth. He did not say you ought to be. You may eventually become. He says you are because you are my people and I have begun to form in you the character traits highlighted in the Beatitudes. You are constituted by my work in you, salt of the earth and light of the world. Refusal to deal with sin within our midst obscures the light and it neuters the saltiness of the salt. And so if we have a passion for God's glory in the church, we will be prepared to engage in necessary, corrective, radical church discipline. Listen to Edwards who addresses this very point when he writes, If you tolerate visible wickedness in your members, you will greatly dishonor God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the religion which you profess, the church in general, and yourselves in particular. As those members of the church who practice wickedness bring dishonor upon the whole body, so do those who tolerate them in it. The language of it is that God does not require holiness in his servants. Christ does not require it in his disciples, that the religion of the gospel is not a holy religion, that the church is not a body of holy servants of God, and that this church in particular has no regard to holiness or true virtue. In other words, if we want to have any credibility that we are what God says we are, then church discipline may be necessary to maintain the honor of our God. Owen writes in a similar vein when he says, And seeing the design of Christ was to have his church holy, unblameable, and without offense in the world, that therein he might make a representation of his own holiness and the holiness of his rule. And whereas those of whom it is constituted are liable and subject unto sin scandalous and offensive, reflecting dishonor on, him, on himself and the church in being the occasion of sinning to others, that design would not have been accomplished had he not given this authority unto his church to cast out and separate from itself all that do by their sin so give offense. And the neglect of the exercise of this authority in due manner was the principal means whereby the glory, honor, and usefulness of the churches in this world were at length utterly lost. Owen, oh, looking back on church history, says one of the primary, he actually states, the primary reason for the church losing the luster of her glory to the dishonor of God was unwillingness to engage in this means of grace. So that's purpose number one. Purpose number two for this discipline is the restoration and salvation of the members of the church. The scriptures clearly teach that all the true people of God shall persevere to the end. Philippians 1 and verse 6. Paul is able to say of those Philippians, confident of this very thing, that he who has begun Gun a good work in you, will perfect it until the day of Christ. But with equal clarity, the scriptures not only teach the certainty of the perseverance of the saints, but the necessity or preservation of the saints. They teach the necessity of the perseverance of the saints. They must persevere in the way of holiness and of obedience if they are to expect to be received with favor in the last day. 
Matthew 22, 14, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. In spite of the fact that because iniquity shall abound, the love of the many shall wax cold, but not of God's true people. They shall persevere in a context very antithetical to that perseverance, very much dampening their ardor and their passion to please Christ. Yet they must, as well as they shall, persevere to the end. Hebrews 10, 38 and 9, after that sober warning against apostasy, the writer to the Hebrews again is confident that he and his readers are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe unto the saving of the soul. They cling to Christ in the death grip of true saving faith, which is always persevering faith. This being true, it is in this sense that corrective, radical church discipline is a loving act an act in which love manifests its principled manliness and its grace. You remember after those strong words of our Lord to the Laodicean church, I'm about to puke you up. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent and engaging in acts of radical church discipline is indeed an expression of principled manly grace. And God knows we desperately, desperately need it. Our great concern, we want to see people persevering. They've been embroiled in a sin that's inconsistent with that perseverance if they continue in that sin. Various levels of church discipline are needed Sometimes to nudge them back, just a public rebuke or reproof nudges them back. Sometimes, like we read in the book of Jude, people need to be snatched back. And when you're snatching someone who's falling, you may not be very gentle with them, and you may not exactly bring them back to where the place of safety is without injuring them a bit. But nonetheless, we're to save some with fear, snatching them out of the fire. So it's the restoration and salvation of the members of the church. And two quotes, both Jeske and Jonathan Edwards. This is a lovely quote from this man who's a Mennonite, Martin Jeske, discipling the brother, writes, There has, unfortunately, been bad excommunication practice, and this has conditioned the thinking of many people to the point where they can see nothing redemptive in the dismissal of a member from the church. Therefore, it is essential to see that excommunication does not represent a breakdown of grace or a departure from the gospel. Excommunication is a renewed presentation of the gospel message to an impenitent brother in that it confronts him with the truth Paul states in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. To utter this truth in warning to those who have apostatized is just as consistent with the nature of the gospel as informing men in evangelism that unless they repent and believe the gospel, they will not enter the kingdom of God. Thus, excommunication rightly practiced never cuts men off from grace. On the contrary, its function is to prevent persons from anesthetizing themselves against grace. Excommunication is the form under which the church continues to make grace available to the impenitent. Excommunication is not then merely loveless condemnation. It is as necessary in spiritual life as candid diagnosis is in medical practice. Without facing the truth, persons cannot find spiritual healing. Far from being unloving, evangelical excommunication is the only loving and redeeming course of action possible 
in given circumstances. The restoration of the sinning brother is one of the aims of radical church discipline. Listen to Edwards. Your own good loudly calls you to the same thing. For what, from what has already been said, you see how liable you as individuals will be to catch the contagion which is easily communicated by reason of the natural depravity in a degree at least, least remaining in the best of men. Beside, if strict discipline be maintained among you, it will not only tend to prevent the spread of wickedness, but to make you more fruitful in holiness. If you know that the eyes of your brethren observe all your conduct, it will not only make you more guarded against sin, but more careful to maintain good works and to abound in the fruits of the Spirit. Thus, you will have more abundant joy and peace in believing. So one of the great purposes is not only the restoration of the brother, but the stirring up of the true people of God. Then thirdly, the advancement of the purity and health of the church itself. One of the purposes of radical church discipline is this, advancing the purity and health of the church. According to Scripture, false living and false teaching have a defiling, contagious effect upon others. We looked at Romans 16, 17. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And the apostle is concerned about that contagious effect of that sinning man. And then Hebrews 12, 15 speaks of a root of bitterness that defiles many. And Paul urges believers not to grieve the Holy Spirit, for that has great corporate implications. And so if we're to have healthy churches, they must be holy churches. Therefore, forms of corrective discipline will be necessary to advance the purity and the health of the church. And you have the Edwards quote there in your notes. And fourthly, there is the purpose of deterring others from sin. This principle is clearly understood, underscored by Paul's words in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20. In the previous hour, I had occasion to mention it. We go back to it in this setting. Here, we have the directive given to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20 that he is not to receive at face value an accusation about a defect in the life of an elder, except it is validated by the necessary witnesses, except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Them that sin reprove in the sight of all that the rest may be in fear. Well, I thought People living in the full blessing of the new covenant should never be motivated by fear. Who said so? Not the apostle. He said, scare the wits out of some people. You got some men that are beginning to toy with sin and lo and behold, an elder has been guilty maybe, say, of a pattern of, of touchiness and uh, being short, fused, when one of the requirements for an elder, he's not to be a striker nor a brawler. He's to be self-controlled. And perhaps there's been an outbreak of an erosion of a lack of self-control. Several of the people have gone to him, spoken to him. He's been defensive. They've gone to the other elders. And sure enough, it's been established. Not such as to defrock him and perhaps recommend his relinquishing his office, but brother so-and-so, upon the testimony of two or three witnesses, we are hereby rebuking him, calling him to reformation and repentance. And people sit there and say, man, the elder gets it straight in the eyeballs, between the, between the eyes, straight in the skull. 
I better get my act together. Somebody may have overheard me ticked off at my wife in the parking lot when she did some little piddling thing and I didn't like and I scolded her in a carnal way. Or perhaps they've seen me in some other relationship. I better get my act together that others may fear also. So the deterring of others. We read in Acts 5.11, it's a wonderful passage, Acts 5.11, how after God himself disciplined those two liars, the Lord showing that discipline is so crucial that he himself rolls up his sleeve and takes over with these two hypocrites, Ananias and Sapphira. What's the result? After they buried the two of them, Great fear came upon the whole church. And beyond that, upon all that heard these things, the apostles continue to work miracles. But then here's one of the effects, verse 13. But of the rest, dared no man join himself to them, howbeit the people magnified them. Word spread. If you play hypocrite in that bunch, their God is so real and so alive, he just might kill you. You're not going to have people lining up in a double row at the front applying for membership. You get in that bunch, you may end up dead. Fear, fear. And it's highlighted as a blessed fruit of God's intervention in direct discipline upon Ananias and Sapphira. And it helped deter others from sin. And that language is taken right out again of the old covenant law, Deuteronomy 17, 12 and 13, and Deuteronomy 13, 11, when parents were to deal with the rebellious, disobedient, profligate son, one of the motives for dealing so drastically, stoning him to death, was that others may fear and do no such wickedness in Israel. It's a grievous thing. So little churches, so walk in holiness and in fidelity to these principles that most people regard the church with such lightness. It's a joke. Nobody's scared to go into their midst. Whereas the apostle and Luke himself in the book of Acts tells us this is a legitimate dimension of healthy church life. Edwards, well, I'll omit that quote, you have it. Uh, quote number 22 highlights this very principle as well. But then there is a fifth purpose for corrective, radical church discipline. And I'm calling it the prevention of a judicial judgment of Christ upon the congregation. To prevent such a judgment. When one of those judgments is mentioned in Revelation 2 and verse 5, we have no reason to think that the Lord Jesus only spoke that once and would only in that situation follow through with his threat. Revelation 2 and verse 5. Here we read, Remember wherefore you are fallen and repent. Do the first works or else. Or else I will come to you and remove your candlestick out of its place except you repent. Here the instance is not failure in church discipline. It's loss of first love. But our Lord threatens, I don't know what else to call it, but judicial judgment and the removal of the candlestick. In the church at Pergamos, it was the failure to discipline false teachers that exposed that church to the threat of Christ. Verse 16 of chapter 2, Repent therefore, or else I will come to you quickly and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Is it war against the errorists where Christ will deal with them directly? I do not know, but he says, I will come. Maybe he's saying, I'll make war against them that indulge and don't deal with these sins. Who wants to be in a church where Christ is at war with you? Not me. 
Remember the principles embedded in that historical incident recorded in Joshua chapter 7 concerning Achan and how the sin of one individual and his family crippled an entire nation. It's a frightening reality. Then according to 1 Corinthians 11.30, sometimes God will judge individuals within the church for their unrepentant sin sin that obviously has not been dealt with in a way of proper church discipline. For this cause, 1 Corinthians 11.30, many are weak and sickly among you, and not a few sleep. And it seems on the surface of things, Paul is actually saying that there were people afflicted with chronic illnesses, and even premature death because of unrepented disorders in conjunction with the Lord's table. Serious business when sin is not dealt with and God comes forth in his own judgment. And then the sixth purpose of corrective discipline is the effectiveness of our witness to the world often demands it, the effectiveness of our witness to the world. I've often thought of this back in the days when I was traveling around the country preaching as an itinerant Bible teacher and evangelist. Church after church that I would go to in broad evangelicalism, it seemed they were passionate to present an image, we're the friendly little church around the corner. Anybody can come among us and feel comfortable, feel at home. And I would go with pastors to that passage in Acts and say, when in the world did you find someone say, I want a church where people are scared to death to become a part of it unless they're really serious with God? And I'd turn to that passage. No man dared join himself. The buzzword around Jerusalem was, hey guys, have you heard about that group meeting in Solomon's porch? Oh, you mean yeah, those, those ones that talk about Jesus? As, yeah, yeah. They're a lovely bunch. They love one another. They get along well. They throw their arms around visitors. They're a real cuddly, cozy bunch. Come on along with me. Well, if that were true, it wasn't long before the buzzword was different. Have you heard about that bunch? What happened? What do you mean? Well, there were two of their members, and they heard that, that some of the members were selling lands and giving all the money to the apostles and distributing to needy people. And these two characters, they wanted a reputation for being very benevolent and outgoing. And they lied to one of the leaders when they brought the money. And, and the leader asked them, they said, yeah, this is the whole shebang. Yeah, we, we converted the land into so many shekels. Here it is, give it. And God revealed to that leader they were lying. They were hypocrites. And you know what God did? He killed them. You mean you go to that place and you don't live straight there, God might kill you? <laughs> I'm going to think twice before I ever show up there. See? No man dare join himself to them. The effectiveness of our witness ceases when we cease to have the power to repel as well as to draw. A healthy church will be both a drawing and a repelling company of God's people. Don't be discouraged. If total pagans show up among you and on the way out say, this is the last time I'll ever come to this place, I thought I'd come here and get chucked under my chin and tickled in my ears and go away feeling good. That preacher stood up there and pointed his finger and called us a bunch of sinners. And he talked about we're going to split hell wide open unless we get changed and talked about born again and all that other kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm going back there again. Good. Good, because when their back's against the wall and they're facing stuff that they can't handle, they'll remember, there's a group of people took God seriously. Maybe that's the place I can go and find help. Don't ever be discouraged when you get news you've had a repellent effect upon some who've come among you. Now, if that's all you have and you don't have favor with the people and people seeing things that attract them, then you've gone too far to something skewed. But the danger in our day 
lies in this area of thinking the church can just make anybody, everybody under any circumstances feel comfortable from the get-go and people are bending over backwards, jettisoning all kinds of biblical principles and truth and directives and regulations for worship and ministry, all because they're dying to prove we're a nice bunch of people and we can welcome anybody under any circumstances. Well, one time I heard Tozer talking about an issue similar to this, and he said, quit it, Reverend, quit it, Reverend. It won't do you any good. I echo my patron saint, Dr. Tozer. Quit it, Reverend, quit it. That's not your calling. Your calling is to be true to the whole counsel of God, even that counsel that calls the church by the presence of God among you, often manifested in faithful discipline, to still have a repelling influence upon outsiders. In the light of our Lord's statement, and in John 13, 35, what happens to the church's credibility before an onlooking world when gross patterns of the sins of lovelessness are known, and once known or tolerated, and they're not dealt with. He says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And then Paul's great passion for the Philippian church. He says, do everything without murmuring and without disputing, questioning, arguing, manifesting a spirit of discontent with the will of God and the ways of God. To what end? that you may be blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke in shining as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And here again we listen to Edwards. The good of those who are without should be another motive to engage in church discipline. What the Apostle says with reference to another subject, 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25, that's where he says, If all prophesy, the unbeliever comes among you, his heart's revealed, he falling down will cry out, God is of a truth among you. What Paul says in that context is perfectly applicable to the case before us. But if all prophesy, there come in one that believes not or unlearned. He's convinced of all, judged of all. The secrets of his heart are manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report, God is in you of a truth. If strict discipline and thereby strict morals were maintained in the church, it would in all probability be one of the most powerful means of conviction and conversion toward those that are without. So, I set before you those six lines of biblical truth answering the question, what are the purposes of God for radical corrective church discipline? And I say in summary of that heading, I trust each of you is firmly persuaded that these six purposes of corrective or radical church discipline combine to demonstrate how crucial an aspect of biblical church life this really is. It should be no wonder that the devil uses many subtle ploys to undermine a biblically framed practice of church discipline. And we must not be ignorant of his devices. At the end of this lecture, I'll give you a rather complete bibliography of reading material that should be helpful, especially to you men, just beginning your ministry, or perhaps not even beginning it. You're in the midst of your formal preparation, gathering the tools to be a responsible edifying expositor of the word, and these things recommended in the notes and to which I will make reference, these are the things that will help you to think clearly and then to expound thoroughly to your people very early in your ministry that this is a church 
that is not only going to frame its public worship by the word of God and the regulative principle, is not only going to be given to prayer and have gatherings specifically to seek the face of God in prayer, but this is an assembly that is going to embrace from Christ those means to keep us a holy people and to make it evident that no one unwilling to walk in visible holiness will have immunity from the discipline of this assembly. So we've considered the duty of corrective discipline established on those two massive pillars and then secondly, we've looked at the six-fold purpose for corrective discipline. And here we'll take a break, and then we'll take up the final two points, the major forms of corrective discipline, and then some practical counsels concerning this matter of corrective discipline. So let's pray, and we'll complete this hour. Our Father, we thank you that your word gives us light on our pathway, setting out these purposes for which you have wisely instituted the various forms of radical and corrective church discipline. And we pray that from that very first principle of passion for your glory to this final principle of desiring to have a true impact upon an onlooking, unbelieving world. Grant our Father that in every assembly represented by these men, there would emerge a consistent, balanced, spirit empowered, Bible directed engagement in this means of grace which you have given us. Seal it then to all of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.